Welcome to Granny Basketball Rules, Updates, and Review, Spring of 2021. You can find the latest version of Granny Basketball Rules at www.grannybasketball.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the link to the online file folder. Then open the rules folder and select the most current version of our rules. A few rules have changed and some have been reworded to clarify the rule. Hopefully this will help with the consistency in officiating. Please be aware that this video was shot during a practice situation where official uniforms are not required. I know we all want to look good while playing granny basketball, but we need to do it in accordance with the rules. The biggest confusion and inconsistency is with those lovely bloomers. As the name implies, the pants need to bloom. That means they need to be baggy and have elastic holding them down at about 5 inches below the knees. Baggy sweatpants and stylish crop pants are not legal. Any player who is not wearing approved bloomers may play in all games that day, but will not be allowed to play in any subsequent games until wearing an approved uniform or has it on order through Granny Basketball. One point will be given to the opposing team for each player that is not wearing an approved uniform. The point or points will be given before each game that day. The host team should note players without proper uniform in the post-game report. The rules also say that the only skin that can show is the face, neck, forearms, and hands. However, if you raise your arms and a little more skin shows on your arms, that's okay. But what about if you have trouble keeping your shirt down? This kind of skin showing is a flesh technical foul, and the result is the other team will get one free throw and ball possession. This foul does not count as a personal foul and can only be called on that person once per game. There have been some pretty creative ways to deal with an uncooperative shirt, like lightweight undershirt. Collar numbers must contain two digits ranging from zero to five. Digits larger than the number five are not allowed. Some illegal numbers are currently grandfathered in. If the original owner of this number retires, the number can no longer be used. Officials should check for jewelry prior to the coin flip. No jewelry except for unadorned wedding bands may be worn. Other jewelry should be removed or taped. Players must comply with jewelry rules in order to enter or re-enter the game. Officials should also check fingernails prior to the game. Any that extend past the pads of the fingers must be trimmed or taped before the player can play. Wearing gloves is okay too. You make the call. <whistles> Rule 3 says when throwing the ball in from the center circle, once the player has possession of the ball, she may pivot, but if she moves her pivot foot, it is a turnover. Bouncing or dribbling the ball is also a turnover. This is a legal center throw-in. Prior to starting the game, the officials should gather captains from both teams for the coin toss. The visiting team will make the call. Winner of the toss will choose possession of the ball for either the first or second half. The other team will then call which end of the court they would like to defend. All right, Kathy, you're the visiting team, so call it in the air, either heads or tails. Tails. It is tails, so do you want the ball first or do you want to pick your side and defer to the third quarter? The ball first. All right. And what side would you like? Going that way. All right, so you're gonna start with the ball going that way.
The rules for overtimes and tie games have been modified, so please pay special attention to this update. Like in the past, if the game is tied at the end of regulation play, a four-minute overtime is used to find a winner. Officials will meet with team captains for the coin toss called by the visiting team. And just like in the past, should the game be tied at the end of the first overtime, a second four-minute overtime would be played to determine a winner. However, if the score would again be tied at the end of the second overtime, the new rule states that a free throw sudden death will occur. At that time, each captain will choose three eligible players, that meaning ones that have not fouled out of the game, to alternately shoot one free throw. The visiting team will shoot first. The team making the most free throws will win the game. Should there still be a tie, the coach will choose three different players to alternately shoot. This process would continue until a winner is determined. And yes, it could come down to guards having to shoot the ball. Regular free throw rules apply. If you caught the fact that some of these shooters stepped on or over the line before the ball hit the backboard or the rim, good job. This shot would be counted as a miss. Also new is a rule that says if time constraints exist, like games have run long and play is well behind schedule, or games are on a time limit, the host team may put the free throw sudden death rule into play for all overtimes. However, both teams and officials must be informed of this prior to the start of the game. There has been some confusion about what constitutes a granny down call, so this rule has been clarified. We all know it's granny down when a player crashes to the floor. Now the rule states, a granny is down when a player falls or descends to the floor, leaving her feet and or making bodily contact with the floor, including a rear end, hand, or knee. So even if a player does not fall completely to the floor, if her hand or knee touches, it is a granny down. You make the call. If you called this a hovering foul, you are correct. This is a caging foul. Reaching over the top and breaking the plane of a shorter player to obtain a rebound is also a hovering foul. What do you think? Is this the foul on a white-shirted player? It happens a lot and quite often does not get called. This is a foul in a multitude of ways. Players can extend their arms forward, as in waiting to receive a ball, but may not extend them to the sides. This is classified as an impeding foul, whether or not contact with an opponent is made. You could also call it caging, or initiating contact, all of which are fouls. What about this one? It's hard to see. If you called it defensive jumping, congratulations, you're on top of things. When a defensive player jumps, they will be given one warning for jumping. Any subsequent jumping by that player will result in a technical foul for delay of game. This foul will count towards their three personal fouls allowed in a game. Who's the foul on here? Even though player B fouls player A, the foul should be called on player C because she initiated the contact with player B that caused player B to fall into player A. It sounds complicated. But think of it as a chain reaction. The foul is called on the player that starts the chain reaction. Well, how did you do? 
Did you get all the calls right? Just remember, the farther off the court you are, the easier it is to see the big picture and get the calls right. It's tough being an official, and we are thankful for all the hard work they put in. There has been a lot of discussion about the fouling at the end of a close game, and at this time, no rules have been changed. However, the ROC recommends that if you intend to foul, please let the officials know, and then please, please keep it safe. Brooke, we're going to intentionally foul. Thank you for telling me. Just a few things about free throws. If an offensive player commits a foul, a forward currently in the game for the other team will shoot. During a free throw attempt, the shooter may dribble the ball, move their feet, or jump as long as their feet stay behind the line. The shooter may not take a running start. Officials should wait until all players are set before handing the shooter the ball. One shot. Just a few odds and ends to finish up. For league games, if a team doesn't have enough roster players to make up a team, they can borrow up to three players from other teams. These players must play in the center position only unless mutually agreeable with both team captains. Players must be borrowed before the game starts. For non-league games, Teams may be made up of players from several different teams, but if this team runs short of players and needs to borrow, regular borrowing rules will apply. I know we all like to fill out those wonderful post-game reports, but they are vital to keep track of what's going on. In addition to filling out normal information to the online folder on the Granny Basketball website, Host teams need to directly contact either the state coordinator, a member of the board of directors, or the executive director to report all uniform violations and technical fouls, as these issues need to be addressed before that team's next playing date. The host team should also directly notify other teams in the division of these violations. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. And thanks to the Center Point Iowa Model T's for helping make the video. Be safe and have a great season.